one of the first things you need to know is that in pediatrics, the heart rate is not the same. So in peds, a neonate can have a heart rate between 90, and that can be at sleeping, and up to 200 when awake. And then one-year-old, the lower number of 90 stays the same when they're sleeping, but uh, the top number of when they're awake starts to go down, so that's 180, and that's the upper limit of normal, so anywhere between this range. And then between 1 and 3, uh, your lower number starts to decrease, so it goes down to 80, and then the upper number definitely decreases to 140. So by the age of 2, I like to think of it this way, that two numbers have decreased. So by age 2, both the upper and lower limit of normal have decreased. And ages 3 to 5, I like to think of it as almost normal, but just a little elevated in the upper and lower limit of normal. And then 5 to 13 is kind of in the same range. And then by greater than 13 years old, they should definitely be in the range of an adult. So that is 60 to 100 beats per minute. So memorizing these heart rates and the specific age range associated will help you diagnose sinus tachycardia, which will be anything over the upper limit of normal for the child's age, or even SVT, which is a little bit simplified into being greater than 180 for a child or greater than 220 for an infant. So when it comes to blood pressure, obviously that changes a little bit when children. So um, I like to use this little formula. So if you're an infant, you want your systolic to be greater than 70. Who cares about the upper limit normal in children because they don't have hypertension. And if you're between 1 and 10, you want your systolic to be uh, greater than your age times 2 plus 70. So if you have a 5-year-old, then times it by 2, so that's 10. So you want their systolic to be greater than 80. So, and then if they are 10 years old and older, you want their systolic to be greater than 90. So a lot of things change in the pathway process of treating certain type of arrhythmias in the pediatric population. And bradycardia is a big one because the most common cause of bradycardia in children is actually hypoxia. So whenever you see uh, bradycardia, so less than 60 or declining heart rate from their normal heart rate ranges of the specific ages, then you need to immediately start valve masking these children. And I mean no less than or no more than 30 seconds. And then if that doesn't work, go to CPR. And then after that, you can add epinephrine or atropine. So the next rhythm I want to talk about is SVT. And in this one, it's just like the adults. You want to start, find out if the patient is stable or unstable. So if they're stable, they get a vagal maneuvers and then adenosine. So that's very similar to adults. But the dosing for adenosine is 0.1 makes per kick. When it comes to unstable SVT, this is where it gets a little bit different because you are allowed to try adenosine first, um, but do not delay treatment. So if they don't have an IV and they're unstable and they're an SVT, go ahead and cardiovert them. But if they have an IV, try adenosine first. And if that fails, then you can start with cardioversion at one joule per kg. The next with me I want to talk about is VFib. It's not very different in the pathway process. You want to start CPR as soon as you see VFib. Um, but you usually have at least two people, and if you do, then you want your compression respiration ratio to be at 15 to 2. Then you're going to want to shock these patients, but the voltage starts at 2 joules per kg and then goes up by 2 thereafter. So 4, 6, then 8. And then the dosing for epi is 0 0.01 mg per keg, which is definitely different from adults. So a couple questions were asked about ventilating a patient. So what's the main downside of hyperventilating a patient? And then after you've placed an advanced airway in a patient in need, what do you need the end tidal CO2 to be at? So the main downside of hyperventilating a patient is decreased cardiac output. Because of that increased thoracic pressure, you should only squeeze approximately half of the bag at a time or 500 to 600 cc's of air at a time. And after you've placed an advanced airway in a patient, you want the end CO2 to be between 35 to 40 milligrams per Hg. So next questions, how often during a code can you reanalyze the rhythm? And how often can you give 0 0.01 mg per kg of epi? Great. So you can reanalyze the rhythm every two minutes and you can give 0 0.01 mg per kg of epi every three minutes. 
Another thing you need to review is all the respiratory disorders. So in upper airway, kids get croup, and that will be that inspiratory strider that you will hear. So make sure you know how to treat croup with nebulized epi and steroids. Also, make sure you know how to recognize asthma and treat asthma, and that is that expiratory wheezing um, and prolonged expiratory phase, and you're going to want to treat this with nebulized albuterol and steroids. And lastly, make sure you can recognize and treat pneumonia. So this child will be febrile, have a history of cough and crackles on exam, and you're going to want to start fluids and antibiotics on these patients very quickly. Also, PALS really likes to test the different types of shocks in the pediatric population. So when it comes to your fluid boluses and a certain type of shock, most shocks get 20 milliliters per gauge e of fluid boluses, but if it's cardiogenic shock, just do 5 to 10 milliliters per kg and over a slow rate.